Hello, everyone. My name is Danae Laura, and I am the Bazaar Program Manager for Cultural Survival. I will be your host during today's online shopping experience. And after two video presentations, you will see me with my set full of beautiful cultural survival bazaar items. We are broadcasting to you today from our office headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is on the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. Since we're here together due to COVID, and this is our first time going online, we ask for your support and feedback about how the bazaar experience was for you. We've done our best to recreate a version of the personal experience we all know and love about the bazaars, and we welcome you to send us your greetings and feedback via email, bazaars at cs.org. As you make yourself comfortable and settle in for the show, we encourage you to have one screen showing the event and another screen available for your shopping pleasure. This way, the bazaar can have the greatest impact for indigenous artists, and you can be enjoying your new items in the coming weeks. As you know, indigenous populations are particularly vulnerable during COVID. So your orders are a powerful contribution to their livelihood and basics like food during the pandemic. Artists access to markets has been disrupted and the virtual bazaar is our attempt at building a bridge to the artists in their communities. Today's presentations will give you both a window into the home studios of indigenous artists and more background into why vendors were inspired to start their fair trade businesses in partnership with indigenous communities. Our first presentation is an introduction for, from our executive director and her presentation is followed by a generous artist donor who has contributed a collection of earrings in support of cultural survival's fundraising goals for this bazaar. With a suggested donation of $50, you can select a pair of earrings you like. Feel free to use the phone number or email in order to order these earrings in this way. Please keep in mind, many indigenous artists live in places without easy access to the internet. While you may be used to dozens and dozens of booths at our in-person events, today we are representing a total of 19 vendors. Lack of access to the internet is a determining factor for both the size of this bazaar and the reason the bazaar has some limitations in being live with the artists. Thank you so much for showing up when we called you to action to participate in the virtual bazaar as a shopper and as a supporter. Indigenous people as a whole and indigenous artists specifically need our support during the pandemic. Cultural survival has been responding to COVID demands in numerous ways, including by shifting the bazaars online. While we know this is not a day under the tent with food, music, and shopping, we invite you to picture yourself as part of a collective of over 500 people preparing to attend this bazaar and thousands of people expressing their interest. You are one of many, and we appreciate you being here and your ability to make a difference. Finally, you may ask yourself, how do I buy something that I want? We will be sharing the websites of the vendors who are presenting in the chat box, so you can shop from there. And that includes 12 vendors who will present today. And all day long, you can visit bazaar.cs.org slash live to access all vendor profiles, which lists every way of purchasing from every vendor, including the seven vendors who will not be on film today. Let's get started. Dear Cultural Survival Community, welcome to our virtual Cultural Survival Bazaar. My name is Galina Angarova, and I'm the Executive Director of Cultural Survival. Today, we welcome you to this online experience. Two months ago, when it became clear that a live in-person bazaar was no longer an opportunity, our team decided to pivot and hold this important space online so that we continue providing and supporting our artisans, their livelihoods, their ways of life and their cultures. Today, we are proud to present a program featuring our artists, staff, and board, and our longtime customers and supporters. Our Bazaar program is an important way to support Indigenous livelihoods. Every piece that is sold at the Bazaar comes with a story, a story of struggle, perseverance, resilience, and ultimately love, love for our cultures, communities, and families. 
The stories are heartbreaking and inspiring at the same time. Back in December, during my first live bazaar in Cambridge, I had the privilege of meeting Akhtar Mir, an artisan from Kashmir. He makes beautiful, embroidered Kashmir shawls. Akhtar was representing his community, his mom, his aunties and uncles. He showed me the video of how the family was producing these beautiful pieces. It touched my heart deeply. And when Akhtar said the art is a way to communicate to the world that they're still here, weaving their stories into the web of life, and that by making this art available for sale, ensures that their story continues. Despite political uncertainties in Kashmir and difficulties with travel, Akhtar made it to the bazaar in December, and it was able to share his family's work with us and with the rest of the world. As I mentioned earlier, when we purchase with a story in mind, a dress is not just a dress. A scarf is not just a scarf. And a pillow is not just a pillow. You purchase, support an artist, their family and their community. Here in the midst of the health, climate and political crisis, I invite all of us to start shifting our collective story of taking and consumerism to a story of relationship building, regeneration and reciprocity. So why does everything that we buy have to come from corporations that benefit from underpaid labor and in unsafe working conditions in China or Bangladesh or in other countries when it can come to from someone you know whose story you've heard and appreciated. It should come directly from the hearts of the people who make these items. So I invite you all to support the narrative shift, to support the cultural shift, support indigenous cultural survival, and put your dollars where it's most needed and appreciated. Indigenous artists, their families, and their communities. Thank you and have a wonderful experience at our cultural survival bazaar. Hi everyone, my name is Daisy Francoeur and I'm an enrolled member of the United Nation of Wisconsin. I'm also Turtle Clan um, and part of the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois Confederacy, which is a confederacy of six tribes um, in New York and Canada. And I'm so excited to be featured as an artist um, for Cultural Survival's virtual, first virtual um, bazaar. And uh, shortly, I'm going to share with you the ways that you can purchase some really cool earrings like these um, in just a moment. So I'd like to share with you all a little bit more about my journey as an artist. Um, I would say not until the last year or two did I actually start embracing that identity um, as an artist. I, I would say I definitely grew up, you know, on the reservation, um, expressing my myself through through various means, but never really thought that that was that I considered myself an artist. And I think that's large in part to colonization and how we are really conditioned to um, view things as transactional, as um, as extractive, and and really this like either or mentality of like you're you're this or you're that, but you can't be both. And so that was reflected in how I viewed myself, and and not realizing that I actually carry a multitude of identities, and so. Over the years, uh, I've had to really decolonize and reorient and redefine um, what art and being an artist means to me. And it's really, it's a way of life. It's, um, it, I don't just create art um, with, you know, through jewelry or painting or poetry, but it's um, also just like how I, it's a, it's a lens. It's how I view the world. Um, and understanding its beauty and giving gratitude towards it. Um, that to me is art um, as well. And I feel really, really lucky that um, my art isn't 
something that I depend on economically for my own livelihood, but for so many uh, artisans, indigenous artisans all over the world, um, that is their primary form of income. And in fact, it's, it's one of the only ways that they are able to support their families and their communities uh, because we are we're forced to operate within an economic framework like capitalism that doesn't support um, our traditional values and our traditional ways of being and knowing. So we have to um, contribute to an industry that doesn't honor the creative process and the intentions that, and, and the prayer and the love that goes into building something, right? It's like, oh, you make this and I'm going to pay you for that. But it's so much deeper than that. So I just wanna remind you all, um, as, you, as you look at my art, as well as the art from uh, other incredible, talented artists, indigenous artists on this platform, please remember that, um, we are forced to operate within an economic framework like capitalism that doesn't support our traditional ways of being and knowing. So we are forced to monetize um, our talent in a way that doesn't, uh, but it's a system that doesn't honor um, our process, our creative process of, of prayer and intention and culture and language and all of these stories that go into into making these things. And so as you're, you're maybe viewing some of my art or the art of other indigenous artisans on this platform in, and wanting to buy something and really admiring it, but thinking, well, it's a little bit too out, it's a little too expensive or, or, or even thinking in your mind, like, is it, it's not worth that. Remember that there's so much more that goes into this art um, that you can't really see, but you can feel it. You can feel it. It's medicine that we are creating for you. Um, and one thing that I really struggle with and have a lot of tension with in, in monetizing um, and feedback that I get a lot really from non-Indigenous people is that um, they'll see my earrings and, and say, well, that's really expensive. And they'll see something similar that's been appropriated um, in fast fashion that might be a fraction of the price. But you have to remember in fast fashion, not only is it extractive and exploitative of people and place um, and our natural resources, but it also is does not have that spiritual creative process when developing something. And to me, you can't put a dollar amount on that. So just remember when you are viewing all of this and, and, and purchasing items that uh, you are supporting the livelihood of of people of their of indigenous peoples, their families, and their communities, uh, which goes towards supporting their cultural continuity, which also supports um, their ability to to govern their lands. Uh, all of that is so tied to each other, um, and as we know, indigenous stewardship is integral to mitigating climate change. So. All of these things are very related. Um, so just remember that when you're supporting an artist, you're supporting a community that supports taking care of, of ecosystems that we are all a part of. Okay, so now to talk a little bit more about um, the earrings themselves. I wanted to make something um, that was reflective of where I'm at in my life. And so as an indigenous woman who was born on a reservation, but now lives in a big city, I wanted to reflect that that moment in my life um, in these earrings. And so what I did was use a combination of traditional raw materials as well as contemporary materials. And some of the traditional materials that I used was um, wampum, mother of pearl, abalone, dentalium, um, birch bark, green agate stone, um, and upcycled wood. And then for some of the contemporary materials, I use gold plated frames, um, some antique sterling silver beads, some seed beads, um, and you know a handful of other things. And so I had so much fun making this collection. And another part of this collection, I made a mini, mini series or mini collection 
uh, uh, liberation earrings, um, including ones like this. And so with these earrings, I wanted them to really reflect uh, the political revolution that we're all a part of and contributing to right now. And as we know, you know, for the last 500 plus years, natural law, natural order has been incredibly disrupted and under attack because of capitalism, colonialism and white supremacy. And in order to restore natural law and our relationships with each other and the natural world and, and, and all living things is we need a restored and repaired relationship with, with the land. Um, and as we know, indigenous peoples are the ones who hold um, the solutions to mitigating and reversing climate change, um, as well as um, really facilitating healthy, thriving ecosystems, including our food ways and our food systems. And so it is through the rematriation and return of land um, that will allow us to restore natural law through indigenous sovereignty and indigenous leadership. And I wanted that to be that story to be reflected in these earrings. And so I hope you all enjoy these earrings. Again, I had so much fun making them. And um, please, uh, please donate to cultural survival as well as purchase um, earrings from all the artisans uh, and purchase art from all the artisans here um, on this virtual bazaar. So y'all go, thank you so much and wishing you all lots of peace um, and happiness for uh, 2020 and beyond. Hi everyone, so the first group that I want to introduce you to today is Guatemala Art and Culture Connection. Founded by Lorna and Imre, they are dedicated to representing artists from the Mayan communities surrounding Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. They highlight many paintings and painters who create beautiful work just like the one behind me. They also share with us about the philosophy that guides their foundation and their mission and all of the symbolism that's involved in the work that is represented from tiny, tiny paintings that fit on tiny easels and create beautiful windows into another world, all the way to large and even larger paintings. There's also embroidery and beadwork, which they'll tell you about. You can find them via their website. And please remember, we rely on you for support of the bazaar. Please call, text, or donate online. Thank you so much for helping us bring Indigenous art to market. To our virtual booth tour of the Guatemala Art and Culture Connection and the launch of our new website and web store, you can access our website through our profile at the Cultural Survival Bazaar site. And also you can go to our website directly at www.guatemayaartandcultureconnection.com. My name is Lorna Kempis. And I'm Imra Kempis. And over 30 Mayan artists and artisans from villages around Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. We have been working with them for over seven years and have developed close relationships with them and their families. We are a social enterprise guided by the principles of fair trade and equal exchange. And we're inspired by the words of the Australian Aboriginal activist and artist, Lilla Watson. If you've come here to help us, you're wasting your time. But if you come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Our mission is to utilize these artistic and cultural expressions as a means of connecting people across borders and cultures, and to support the artists, artisans, and local projects in the communities we work with. Our vision is for this project to foster deeper understanding, mutual appreciation, and greater cooperation among peoples of different origins and customs. I'd like to offer you a brief tour of our booth and unique, colorful, and vibrant arts and crafts. The paintings are oil on canvas and come in a variety of themes, sizes, and price ranges to fit your tastes, budgets, and to fit on your wall or a special place in your home. They also make wonderful gifts. 
Food is an important way people connect with each other across cultures. The fruit and vegetable paintings are popular and often used to brighten up the kitchen or dining room. This painting by Gregorio Coche of the four colors of corn, red, yellow, black, and white, signifies unity of the four races. The Mayan people also believe they were created from corn and they call themselves the people of the corn. Here are some other paintings by Gregorio of chilies, melons, and limes. Another popular theme is daily life. These paintings show the marketplace and harvesting of coffee and other crops. Many utilize a unique vista de pajaro, or bird's eye view. This painting by Anjalina Kik Ishtamer is a wonderful representation of the vibrancy and brilliant colors of a typical market in Guatemala. Anjalina is one of a handful of women artists. This painting by Ocronio Tabahe of harvesting corn has a wonderful sense of design that combines the abstract with his subject matter. And here are some other styles of harvesting coffee and corn by Humberto Cortez and Noe Yocum. Birds, nature, and landscapes are also very popular subjects. Living in harmony with nature is central to the Mayan culture. This landscape by Pedro Gonzalez shows a woman gathering water in a traditional pottery jug and fishermen on Lake Atitlan. And this painting by Andres Roche is of the Quetzal, the national bird of Guatemala. For the Mayans, the Quetzal represents freedom. These exquisite miniatures by Sara Ashka show some of the more than 450 varieties of birds around Lake Atitlan. This wonderful nature scene is by another of the few women artists, Vicente Pozul. The backs of women, espaldas, are often painted to show the huipils, typical dress unique to each village that the women continue to wear. Women hold a special place in the Mayan society as stewards of the culture. This espalda by Lorenzo Cruz shows this unique method of applying the paint in a way to create a three-dimensional effect. He is one of a number of artists who have gained international recognition of their work. Preserving their traditions and worldview, what they call the Mayan cosmovision, and raising awareness of the impact of colonization and globalization on their culture is also very important for the artists. These paintings by Juan Bernardo and Juan Edwin Mendoza are of the weaver represented by the Nawal, what the Mayans term energy, bats, and the goddess Ishel, who they believe keep the order of the world and their culture intact with their weaving. This painting, titled ironically, El Fruto de la Invasión, The Fruit of the Invasion, by Mario Chabahai, depicts the impact of the Spanish conquest and colonization on the Mayan people. This is a representation of an ancient Mayan pictograph and glyphs by Juan Carlos Chabahai, who taught himself how to interpret the pictographs and write the glyphs. We also like to support and encourage some of the younger and more innovative artists that are experimenting with new ways to combine their traditional Mayan roots with more modern forms of expression. In addition to the paintings, we also sell a variety of beadwork and tapestries. The beadwork exemplifies the artisan's extraordinary craftsmanship and artistry. They constantly come up with new designs and color configurations. Beaded hummingbirds are best sellers and available in a variety of colors and designs. In the Mayan culture, hummingbird is associated with the wind, which renews and refreshes and distributes pollen, supporting new life. The energy of the hummingbird brings beauty and creativity. In addition to the hummingbirds, we sell beaded animals, bracelets and necklaces, and assortments of ornaments and keychains. Here are some of the beaded turtles and some of our striking necklaces. One of the artisans, Lola Gonzalez, makes beaded belts, which can often be used as wall hangings as well. She is a single mother who supports her family with her beadwork. We are helping her daughter, Stephanie, realize her dream of becoming a doctor by raising funds through GoFundMe. We also sell tapestries and textiles from other villages on the lake and a town called Nawala. This weaving here is done by a woman called Irma, who's part of a weaving cooperative. She uses a backstrap loom and natural dyes. 
the weavings from Nawala, there's a town in the highlands in Guatemala, and their tapestries are totally unique to that village. These are especially challenging times for the artists and artisans, as the income from sales of their art and crafts has dropped dramatically. We have committed to doing what we can to help them through these times by creating a way for them to sell online. We invite you to visit our new website, www.guatemayaartandcultureconnection.com, an online store where you, we offer many more of the paintings and crafts, and you can learn more about the artists, Lake Atitlan, and the Mayan history and culture. You will also have the opportunity to sign up for our newsletter for a chance to win our new website launch giveaway of a painting of $45 value. On behalf of the artists, artisans, and programs we support, we thank you for joining us on this virtual tour of our booth. Les agradezco mucho y gracias. Muchas gracias. 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 This is Adriana at the Guatemala Art and Culture Connection. How can I help you? Yes, Adriana. Good afternoon. My name is Avesh and I'm calling from Canada. I'm inquiring about uh, the paintings that you have in your website. Can you please tell me a little bit about, uh, about your, your business? Sure, and yeah. thank you very much for calling today, Avesh. Um, so our enterprise um, focuses on using artistic and cultural expression as means of connecting people across borders. Um, especially we are looking to show craft from indigenous Mayan villages from the Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. We are a social enterprise that is uh, focusing on fair trade and equal exchange, and it's inspired in indigenous art, Mayan indigenous art. Is Great. there something in particular that you're looking to purchase? Yes, I was actually looking for paintings that were done, that are done by indigenous artists. And also, uh, for me, it's very important that they receive uh, the funding, the, 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 the money from, from the purchase. And I see mm -hmm. that you, you guys are doing that. Um, in general, I'm looking for landscapes or corn or paintings of women. Um, like I'm very open for any options. And to me, it's so important because um, my family is from Guatemala that has migrated mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Guatemala and we need to have um, some art from home. Yeah, definitely. Uh, as you can see here on our website, we have a variety of uh, paintings. We have some that represent uh, corn, which is very important in the Mayan culture. We have some others that have fruits, women that are wearing the traditional clothing. Um, and it's very important to say that we focus on fair trade and all these paintings are coming directly from indigenous artists. Here I can show you this, uh, this is a beautiful painting that has some fruits. We have others here with um, birds, uh, flowers, different landscapes. We have a variety to choose. Thank you. I think I'll get the one from corn and the other one from, from women. Next up, we have Deborah, who will be touring us around her at-home art studio. We're really fortunate to have Deborah join us today as both a vendor and artist, and later she'll be sharing with us a music offering. The best way to reach her is via Facebook. You can contact her via email and phone to place your orders. She is indigenous to New England and because cultural survival is based in New England, in Massachusetts, and our bazaars are hosted in person usually, in both Massachusetts and Rhode Island, we're so delighted that she's able to join us as a representative of the Seekonk Poconoet and Wapadoag community. Please enjoy and please remember, we rely on your donations, your support to make Indigenous art possible to bring to market through the Bazaar program.
We invite you to call, to text, and to donate online. Thank you so much, and please enjoy Deborah's presentation. Hi. Rakasui is Patusipo. In my Wampanoag language, that means, hi, my name is Talking Water. In the English language, my name is Deborah Spears Moorhead. I am a Seacon Poconoke in Wampanoag, and I come from Massasoit. He's my direct descendant. Um, he was the one that, back in 1620, who saved the Pilgrim's life on their first year of arrival um, on this land, uh, homeland. He saved them from starvation. And Massasoit made a treaty with them for 50 years, which he honored right until his death. Um, Massasoit also um, saved Roger Williams' um, life when he was fleeing from the Massachusetts Bay Colony because they didn't like the fact that he believed in religious freedom and he thought that they would be deceptive to my ancestors by stealing the land right off from under their feet. And so uh, Massasoit brought Roger Williams to Providence when he, when he found him in uh, the woods of Massachusetts, fleeing from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So we all know about dreams went on to found Rhode Island. So my people made peace treaties um, that we honor, but they haven't honored ours. I mean, yeah, you know, things haven't. So the people from the Massachusetts Bay Colony, those were the original people that uh, the participants that started the United States government. My tribe, the Seacon Poconoke Wampanoags, that I wrote this book about, they, we have, we're not federally recognized because the way that we survived was through silence. So because we were the, the family of King Philip, Massasoit's son, we had to stay silent for 400 years. Um, so because of, you know, of the genocide that was on this land, the um, oppression, and then the assimilation. So that's how my people survived that. So we, we will get that little recognition, but, you know, it'll take time. But it's only been 400 years. Uh, I have a bachelor's of fine arts. Well, I have a master's of arts in built sustainability from Delta College. So I wrote that book as part of my uh, capstone. After I finished my capstone, I wrote the book. My daughter Jackie is filming this. I'm in the process of working on that painting of her. I had one of her when she was two years old. So all these pictures that you see are from the Eastern Movement Native American people that come to, I either, um, most people come to my uh, studio, they tell me the stories of resilience and fortitude and how their family survived for the last 400 years. And uh, so I teach drawing and painting from my studio. I, um, I done murals. I, my last mural was in 2019. Uh, I did a few in the year 2019. This one is the Cypress Street mural. It's on Cypress Street in Providence. It's a land acknowledgement mural. Um, I sing with Nedeker Singers, that means my sisters, and we perform everywhere. Um, I did this mural for the Providence Preservation Society in 2019. It has four panels in there about um, how, what was the usage of the, of the water and how the Providence River survived through all the uses for 400 years, and also what happened on the river bank. It was a very historic place. Uh, cultural survival is very has been very good to me. They exposed my art in my, you know, so many times um, since I've been showing my work with them. I've they've put my pictures on covers of magazines, and uh, I also did a mural for the National Museum of the. American Indian Smithsonian's for teaching, that was um, in 2005, for teaching um, Native children how to uh, know the tactics of coloni techniques of colonization and how to um, work against them, to do the opposite. I'm in the process 
I was just finished a sculpture with Allison Newsom. She asked me to be the Native American consultant on the origins of these um, stories of Sky Woman and Three Sisters. She, we collaborated together to make a sculpture. Um, it's on Empire Street Plaza in Providence. It's there until October. And so she had me draw pictures of the origins of, of Sky Woman and Three Sisters. And she made sculptures from them. We had them. She went to Thailand and had them made into sculpture. And that's how we collaborated together on her rain catching sculpture. Her rain catching sculpture captures the rain. Now here's some of these, and that rain is used to water the plant. These are some of my images that I've, um, you know, designed t-shirts. No more stolen sisters. It comes in every color, gray, black, purple. There's an epidemic right now of too many women. Um, there's only one woman is too many of women being stolen. This image won um, National Congress of American Indian Award, Art Award. Um, they used it. So it's um, a picture of Leah Hopkins. She was dancing, dancing fancy at Brown University Powell. This one is Paddle My Canoe. It's good for when you're going out for paddles. Um, I like to do wools because I'm wolf land and nice, simple, elegant floral designs. Um, this one, the white wool comes in every color. Indigenous wine comes in every color. I also purple for no more stone sisters. I, I have this available. Um, and I started doing skirts, ribbon skirts, and here's some examples of them. Uh, so you, if in order to get a hold of me, you can go to Painted Arrow Studio, Talking Water Productions, on my Facebook. And I also have another Facebook, Deborah Spears Moorhead. Um, and my email is paintedarrow2 at yahoo.com or dsmoorhead at gmail.com. Or you can just call me. It's on my website, 401-301-3691. And here's some pictures to look through. Every image that I have comes in every different size. You can have them... Greeting cards, um, eight by eight and a half by 11, um, 11 by 17, or any dimensional size that you would like. I also have perfumes, fragrances, um, and soaps, and coffee. So that's it. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you on my website. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Mark Camp. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of Cultural Survival, and I, I also shop at the Cultural Survival Bazaar, and I'm here with my colleague Agnes, and we're looking at Deborah Spears Moorhead's work. Hi, Agnes. Well, I, I'm really glad that she's participating in, in the virtual bazaar because I always enjoy looking at all the beautiful work, um, her paintings, um, and all the cards and the different sizes of paintings that she has at the bazaar. So it's really great. Oh, look great. at that Providence River one. That was great. I like that one. Oh, this wolf one is actually really nice. And I, I just noticed that she also is selling t-shirts, which is a new addition. I like the cards very much, and I, I like the t-shirts. And it's always so nice uh, at the bazaars. Uh, here in in Massachusetts and Rhode Island to have participation from Native artists from this region in New England. For sure. Um, I wonder how we can purchase these. Um, maybe I should contact her through her Facebook page. Oh, and I you, also you can, see. Yeah, go on, Agnes. You could also, there, there's also an email address. Do you have any other suggestions on how to co contact her to purchase these? Well, Some of these paintings. Email address right there. Um, so I think that's probably the the best way to do it. I mean, a, a lot of the artisans don't have their own websites and so forth. So you know, emailing and Facebook that's the way to get in touch with them and buy. So now that you've seen Deborah's tour of her art studio, I hope you are making the best 
of our tendency to double screen these days where we're either watching something on a computer or watching something on a TV and also with our phones out. So I hope you visited her Facebook page, maybe checked out some options for gifts, maybe greeting cards, maybe a poster for your wall at home. Keep in mind, she is happy to hear from you via Facebook, email, or phone. All of that information is available either on her artist profile or uh, by visiting her Facebook page that was shown in the presentation. We're including links to all of the websites and all of the social media in the chat boxes in Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. So please do check the chat box. Next, and related to this beautiful basket I'm holding, we have a presentation from Grace from Eva Nico. And Eva Nico is a woman owned business that connects us to indigenous artists in Botswana and South Africa. This basket has been through many a fruit load. Every week I fill up a fruit basket and most weeks I get through the fruit, but let's say I've had a particularly busy week or it's particularly warm weather, it doesn't always get eaten. What I learned from Grace is that this can be washed because it's made of telephone wires. So it is not only sustainable because it's reusable, but it's washable. So that's just one of the many cool items you'll see on the Even Nico website. Please do check it out. And please remember, we rely on your donations to make the bazaars possible. Thank you so much. Please call Cultural Survival, text Cultural Survival, or visit us on our website to donate. My name is Grace, the founder and CEO of Eva Nico Gifts and Home Decor. Uh, Eva Nico Gifts and Home Decor started seven years ago. We've been in business for the last seven years. Um, our mission is to promote our culture and uh, to promote the artisan um, skills to create the market for them here in USA for our communities and also in Europe. I'm proud to say that Ifa Nico has done the following just in seven years. We have attended uh, annual trade shows here in USA and in Europe. And in seven years also, we've been to the Hollywood for the Detail Emmy Awards and uh, we managed to capture some market where our culture is represented, especially in the museums here in USA and in Europe. And on top of that, I'm so proud and thankful to Cultural Survival. The Cultural Survival Bazaar has helped us also promote on retail the products for our artisans and also to, to represent our culture. We've been working with the culture survival for the last four years. And in four years, we are so grateful that our artisans have been happy with the results and what we've been doing with the culture survival to put the food on their table and send their children to school. For that, Platform Culture Survival, we thank you so much and thank you for giving us that kind of kind of platform. We are so grateful. Here with me, I have a few cultures to present to you and the products that they make. This is made out of a, a vintage grass. It's made out of vintage grass out of Botswana. So they do a variety according to the size and to your liking all these are from Botswana. And here I have the clicket click. Most, most people like this clicket click because the way it's done, it's made out of recycled plastic bottles. We work with everything, everything recycled. We don't trash anything. So this, you can, when it's open, it looks like this and you can put a planter in it and put water because it can still hold water because inside is still a plastic. And when you close it, it can close like this. It's also good for dish wrapping. It comes in different, in two different sizes. We have a small size inside, but it is sold individually. The small size is a half liter water bottle. So this is how it looks like. And also you can use it for a 
pen, pencil holder in your office or toothbrush toothpaste in your bathroom. And that's how we had introduced these funds for the summer. These funds are amazing. They are good. They are made out of African fabric called Kitengi. You can also hold it or you can also use it as a, a deco in your house. So when you tie this, you can hang it somewhere in the house as a deco. So this is multi-purpose. You can use it for so many things. And when it's closed, this is how it looks when it's closed. You can, it can fit in any purse, even if the purse is very small. And we have another group that will present. They do the bead work. These are all hand beaded. This is a bottle stoppers, like wine bottle stoppers. They also do uh, fridge magnets, small little gifts to give fridge magnets. Everything is beaded. This is beaded like in a form of a heart. And then they're doing these amazing, beautiful spoons that have been selling for us so, so, so great. So they come in mold colors and they're made out of uh, beads and uh, bamboo tree. The tree is really good and very durable. They also come in black and white. And then we have the pasta spoons. They also come in mold colors and they're sold in a set. Mold colors and black and white. And then we have the famous telephone wire. Most of our uh, cultural survival bazaar clients like telephone wire so much. We do a lot with telephone wire. We start with the small privets. These are like coasters. And then we do the soap. We call it the soap dish because the mold used for this is a soap dish because everything we do has a mold. And the mold for this is a tuna tin. That's why we call it a tuna can. That's why we call it a tuna tin. So this, the cup, and this size, our most selling sizes. So in the cup, you can use it also for pen pencil holders in your office, or toothbrush toothpaste in your bathroom, but also it can be a flower vase on your dining. If you put a glass of water inside, you can put fresh flowers. And then we have the very interesting part. We also do telephone wire necklaces, easy to put on. We do them in so many different colors. Telephone wire, you know, telephone wire has so many different colors. When you open the big cable of telephone, you will find so many different colors inside like this. It has so many different colors. Everything is natural. Everything is washable. Everything, there's no any artificial colors used. We also do the bracelet. This bracelet is big like this, but you coil it around your wrist and it is one bracelet and it fits every attire in your closet. We have different colors. So this is how the bracelet looks. It's very beautiful. So we have also this shape. This one, we call it a triangular ball, uh, a plate. You can use it for keys as you're on your door or nuts or anything. Then we have this nice basket. This you can use it for fruits, for fruits on your island or in the dining. Also, it's a decorative item. And then we have these big ones, the extra large ones. This you can use them for like a house hanging, house hanging, or you can also use it as a centerpiece. They are very beautiful colors. We do them in different sizes. That is the extra large, the large, the medium, and the small. So um, we have a variety of things. You can find them on our website. Our website is www.eveandnickel.com. I spell it www.eveandnico.com. You can also follow us on our Instagram. You can like us on our Instagram. And we, are we will be so happy to see you. And thank you for your support. After seeing the Even Nico video, I'm really excited to see what their options are. Yeah, they look like they have a lot of diverse ranges, like from kitchenware. I really enjoy the the artisan and artwork. Mm -hmm. And the colors are very vibrant and summery. Oh my goodness, I love those necklaces. I can't believe they're made out of 
what was it? Telephone wire? Yeah. All, all their items, like these earrings, are made out of recycled material. Wow, that's so cool. It makes me feel good when I buy things, too. I know it's 100% recycled. Oh, yeah, and those clickety-click boxes are recycled as well. And who knew telephone wire could be so beautiful, like the colors? Yes, the, look at these designs as the baskets they're really beautiful wonderful vibrant colors mm -hmm. perfect as a decoration or to use as a bowl which one's your favorite i really like this black and white one here i noticed you could put flowers in that too so it's actually um waterproof oh cool yeah. And they also have other baskets for decor, like this one. Good day, everyone. I'm happy to be able to talk with you today in support of Cultural Survival's first virtual bazaar. My name is Peter Meyer, and I've been participating in cultural survival activities for several years, including buying crafts work, donating funds, and hosting fascinating indigenous artists and fair trade vendors at my home in Eastern Massachusetts. It is very important that we are all here today to recognize, honor, and financially support indigenous peoples, their families and communities, and their skilled and beautiful craft work from so many countries around the world. I'd like to take this opportunity to greet some of the friends and artists from around the world who have stayed with me over the past few years. Timotea Carita Sakaka, a textile maker, dyer, and weaver from Peru who uses only natural fibers and natural dyes. Mir Hussein from uh, Kashmir, another textile weaver, and a sewer who also represents other uh, artisans from his country. Amalia Palomino Jimenez and her brother who produce astounding and delightful small carved and painted wooden figures sometimes placed in little boxes. Albert Gomasala, from the country of Andorra, who is a promoter and vendor of indigenous natural textiles. Magno Caterino from Colombia, representing the Zenu Hats Cooperative, from whom I bought this attractive woven straw hat. And finally, I'd also like to greet or say salam alaikum to Berber master carpet weaver, Hossein Bazin of Algeria. Why do I do this? Why do I host cultural survival artisans at my home? Why do I donate funds to cultural survival? Why do I purchase indigenous crafts for myself and as original and creative gifts for my family and friends? All over the world, indigenous peoples are under attack. Their land is being taken by large and distant corporations and governments. They are being prevented from immigrating to places of safety, from strife and disease-ridden lands where they live. And they're being blamed for the spread of pandemic diseases, such as coronavirus, SARS, Ebola, and AIDS. I'd like to urge you as a participant in this online bazaar to visit the online shops. The beautiful items on display are not mass produced cheaply from inferior materials. They are lovingly and carefully handcrafted from natural products by families or villages in the Americas, in Africa, in Asia, and in Eurasia. 
If you don't feel the need to purchase items, then I urge you to support the important work of cultural survival organization by making a generous donation. And if you enjoy worldwide intercultural experiences and you have spare bedrooms in your house, why not open your home to the visiting indigenous artisans? The conversations I've had have been fascinating and I've learned so much about other cultures. Or do all three, purchase gifts, donate and host. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I hope you enjoy the bazaar. Hopefully, we may all meet in person next year. So now that we've had a chance to visit with even Nico and Peter, we're moving on to U.S. Sherpa. And Anil has a special story, himself immigrating from an indigenous community of Tibetan origin in Nepal all the way to Vermont, where he founded U.S. Sherpa. He is the leader of a family-owned business that works with a collective of artists there in Nepal. And I have a few samples of family-loved mittens and head wraps for the cold weather. So I know it's July. I know we're not thinking about snow. But... If you're living in New England or an area where it gets cold, you might want some of these. One of our CS staff members offered to gather her U.S. Sherpa items. And she apologized to me for them to not be in new condition. And what I told her is this is such the story of the cultural survival items that we purchase because the goal of them is to be beautiful and to be used and worn and loved in everyday life, not only to be hung on the wall and be decor, although, of course, they're used in both ways. So U.S. Sherpa, U.S. Sherpa, U.S. Sherpa, these ones are particularly loved. And I like the style actually when there's uh, no fingers. I like to be able to still feel warm, but if I need to do something with my hands during the cold weather. So great options. And as you'll see, there are lots of cold weather options, but I have to mention that I also have my eye on a pair of warm weather loungewear pants or yoga pants. So definitely check out the website. You can order there. And please remember, we rely on you, your donations to make it possible to bring indigenous art to market. Please call Cultural Survival, text us, or donate on the website. Thank you so much and enjoy Amiel's presentation about U.S. Sherpa. There's beautiful mountain views. My name is Ongel Sherpa. I founded U.S. Sherpa in 2005 after getting a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to come to the United States. My family and I came from an indigenous background representing the Sherpa culture who came from Tibetan origin. Growing up and experiencing poverty in Nepal, I worked as a Sherpa guide in the trekking field while attending school. The trekking and mountaineering field led me to connect with Dr. Jeff Tabin, a Brahmant doctor who had summited Mount Everest with my uncle and then gone on to found the Himalayan Cataract Project. I was incredibly fortunate to live with this generous family in Brabant who helped with my education and inspired ways I could give back to the marginalized communities in Nepal. My family in Nepal became a partner of HCP to provide housing and travel services for the nonprofit organization. U.S. Sherpa produces and distributes fine artisan made goods that are handcrafted in Nepal. Our deep roots in Nepal allow us to produce high quality products while valuing the artisan's labor and need to have sustainable and viable economic opportunities. We focus on sustainability and long-term relationships while emphasizing making affordable products for all consumers. 
Our work involves producing and selling crabs from various indigenous groups from Nepal, such as Sherpa, Taman, Newari, and Madesi ethnic groups. We sincerely invite you to attend the Cultural Survival Virtual Bazaar and support all these amazing artisans and vendors. You can shop at www.ussherpa.com and use promo code BAZAR10 for a special discount. We thank you again for your continued support. is like you know lifelong project for me as a kid growing up in nepal anjil sherpa dreamed about coming to the u.s but he never dared to think that it actually might happen when his uncle a sherpa guide from mount everest helped the vermont doctor summit the highest peak on the planet well let's just say karma or whatever you call it had different plans more on that in a minute because this whole thing gets a little complex Fast forward to U.S. Sherpa. If you're a fan of the Outdoor Gear Exchange in Burlington or Phoenix Books, you might know about U.S. Sherpa. And full disclosure, I've been enjoying their stuff for a while now. It all started when Onjil was 14 years old, when he crossed paths with Vermont doctor Jeff Tabin. And, okay, here's where it gets a little crazy. After Tabin climbed Mount Everest with Onjil's uncle, they got to know each other. Back then, Tabin was a general doctor. But after visiting Nepal, meeting Anjil and his uncle, and climbing Everest, Tabin ran into a Dutch team of doctors performing free surgeries to remove cataracts. For Dr. Tabin, this was mind-blowing. When he got back to the U.S., he trained as an ophthalmologist, went back to Nepal, founded the Himalayan Cataract Project, which is now based in Waterbury, Vermont. He also helped Anjil Sherpa immigrate to the U.S., where he finished high school, went to Champlain College, got married, started a family, and founded his company, U.S. Sherpa. But here's the kicker. Anjil Sherpa was so grateful for everything Dr. Tabin did for him that now his company is a partner with the Himalayan Cataract Project. For me, it was really the, you know, like me coming here, getting this incredible opportunity to go to school and being an American citizen, that just felt like there's big responsibilities because there are a lot of uh, marginalized other uh, folks that are not in the same uh, condition as I am. To sum this all up if I can. Okay, here it goes. A doctor for Vermont travels halfway around the world, has a life-changing experience that basically alters his career forever. He meets a local kid there, then alters that kid's life forever, creates a nonprofit to help blind people, then said kid he helped move to Vermont, then creates another company that goes on to alter the lives of more people back in Nepal by giving them sustainable jobs and And now both the doctor's nonprofit and US Sherpa are partnering together to help even more people. Sorry if I miss anything, but you get the idea. And we do feel that we are making a difference by one hat at a time. video of U.S. Sherpa. It just really made me want to go to Nepal and being able to look at these items makes me want to um, be able to support the project that they have there. Yeah, I agree. And also like hiking in Nepal seems amazing. It really made me want to buy some outdoor clothes and go for a hike. Look at this shawl. That's stunning. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I really like that color of that scarf. A very natural feel to it. Mm -hmm. It's only 22. 
yeah, they have a lot of stuff on sale. Hmm, what else do they have? I actually oh. bought um, this cashmere hat for my mom for her birthday. Yeah, well, they have mittens. Plenty of options. Look at this. And all the items are hand woven, handmade. Mm -hmm. really oh, and some yoga wear. Okay. They've got a wide variety of products. These pants look really comfortable. Perfect for summertime. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I'll get a pair. Wow, $15? Hi everyone, I have a Zenzile Foundation basket in my hand and I'm so excited to tell you about this project because it is a really wonderful example of true empowerment and multi-layered collaboration that avoids many of the pitfalls that occur because of racism and because of the interactions between communities of privilege and communities that have been oppressed over time. So the Zinzilli Foundation was founded 20 years ago through a collaboration between two women, one American and one from Zimbabwe, who noticed that because of the AIDS epidemic, there was a large population of youth who were orphaned and they were motivated to create a means of income that would make it possible for care providers who brought those youth into their homes to actually provide for them, pay their school fees. And what you'll see in this coming video is the story of a young man who went from being supported all the way in first grade, who is now a New York City master's student and telling us about what these baskets really truly represent. But what I want us to keep in mind as we hear the story and shop the baskets is that our interconnection is what has created the disparities that exist. And it's important to consider when we're shopping fair trade because this is not an act of charity. This is not giving to someone who does not have the ability to do on their own but instead it's providing all of the benefits of what it means to be part of the human community and what it means to not be oppressed, what it means to not be held down. So Zinzilli Foundation has many, many baskets to shop from their website, $20 and up. Please do consider donating to support bringing Indigenous art to market by calling Cultural Survival, texting us, or by donating on our website. And without further ado, please check out the Zinzilli story. Uh, hello, my name is Innocent Mpoki, and I'd like to share with you uh, some of the work that is being done with the Zinzilli Foundation in Zimbabwe. The Zenzel Foundation is run by two women, um, Nancy Clark, who is a retired nurse uh, in Vermont, and Priska Namapare, who is a retired professor of nutrition. Um, the Zenzel Foundation was created uh, 20 years ago during the peak of uh, the HIV AIDS pandemic in Zimbabwe. The HIV AIDS pandemic in Zimbabwe created uh, you know, a number of social problems and one of these uh, problems was um, a generation of orphans who either lost both parents to HIV or, you know, lost one parent and the living parent, you know, was sick uh, and incapacitated and unemployed. And, you know, the orphans who lost both parents were staying with a caregiver. Uh, and, you know, even the orphans who were staying with one parent also had to be under the care of someone who could physically do the work to support them. Um, uh, these, key, these caregivers of the orphans, you know, they were, they were subsistence farmers and there's no source of income and, you know, education is more not free. So this was a problem. Uh, and it is within this context 
that the Zenzle Foundation was created in order to address the social problem. And the foundation works to empower the caregivers uh, by generating income so that they can you know, pay school fees for orphans. And um, you know, the caregivers make baskets um, like this one. Uh, you know, the baskets are all made out of natural material and the material inside uh, is grass which is harvested from the African, you know, savanna grasslands and the material binding the basket together is uh, fiber which is made from sisal which is also natural and the painting or the dye that they use to color the basket uh, comes from tree leaves or barks and um, you know sometimes they have to mix up the leaves or the barks in order to produce uh, the kind of you know color that they want like this would be pink you know and this is yellow um, and this basket will be you know it's uh, white which is the natural color of the fiber and brown and yellow and you know the basket can be used uh, for a number of purposes you know uh, two popular uses one is for decoration you know just hang it on your wall for decoration you know you can also use it as a gift to someone else you know the basket can be used for storage like you can put you know some fruits you know you can put you know some things in there um and the uh, revenue from the basket sales uh you know 100 percent of the revenue from the basket sales is then sent to zimbabwe to pay for the school fees and currently, uh, the Zenzela Foundation is paying school fees for 800 orphans um, from first grade up to university or college. And there are about 350 women who participate in the basket making projects. Uh, and these women come from 13 villages uh, in Masingo province, Zimbabwe, Chile district. Um, you know, I am actually one of the beneficiaries of the Zenzle Foundation. Uh, the foundation has been helping me stay in school for the last 20 years uh, since I was in first grade. And currently I am a graduate student uh, in New York City uh, where I'm studying Master of uh, International Affairs at Baroque College. Um, please enjoy the next uh, slideshow which is a collection of uh, pictures that were taken by Nancy Clark and the Priscanama Pare during their last um, field trip to Zimbabwe. <laughs>
thank you for your interest and uh, we hope that you will support our work by purchasing baskets um, through the cultural survival bazaar um, thank you for your interest again and please visit our website uh, zenzelefoundation.org to see more of our work and what we do in Zimbabwe thank you Well, I really resonate with their mission in supporting um, villages in Zimbabwe. And 100% of all the basket sale proceeds pay for school for HIV orphans. So there's all these basket options and each and every one for just $20 supports them. Which one do you like? Wow, they all look so amazing. I really like the colorful ones. A lot of patterns. Yeah, it's such a diverse range of designs. I wonder how they come up with the designs. It's just incredible to see. I'd love to hang these on my walls. Which three do you think would look nice together? Ooh, that one. That one seems like a really nice gentle touch. Yeah, it's a good idea to hang them on your wall as decoration. This is inspiring. <laughs> and you can use them as a bowl. Got a lot of uses. I think it would be cool to add that one with a more colorful one. Yeah, you can do a little matching, mismatching the mm -hmm. items. I like that cream with the pink. Oh, and this, they remind me of stars sometimes, like the universe. It's really beautiful. Or some look like flowers as well. Very interesting design work. Intricate. You can inter interpret them as you wish. Like I was thinking about the sun, you were thinking about stars. Okay, so I hope that you had a chance to purchase a basket and that you're ready for our next guest speaker. The next video that you'll see is from Roz, who has generously been donating the Tiverton Four Corners location for our bazaar for the last 20 years. If we were together this weekend, she would be with us celebrating 20 years of indigenous art right there in Tiverton. Hello, my name is Rosalind Weir, and I welcome you to Tiverton Four Corners in Tiverton, Rhode Island. Today, we are having a virtual celebration of what would be the 20th year of the Cultural Survival Bazaar in this very spot. This is the Sel Seabury House, built in 1750, a farm originally and home to a sea captain. This plot of land is part of an 18th century village which was founded 350 years ago. In 1972, when Cultural Survival was founded, my late husband Jim and I joined the organization as subscribers to the magazine as well as supporters of the various bazaars which were held in Cambridge. Jim had been in the Peace Corps in Crossroads, Africa, where his architectural and building projects involved his building and supporting communities by providing a sustainable infrastructure. In 1984, we set about to revitalize and preserve this little historic rural village. It is perhaps only in the hindsight of 2020 that I can see there are similarities between these two projects. I see parallel struggles to stave off the pressures of huge global economic forces which threaten to devalue and obliterate local cultures and small businesses. Multinational and big box stores have forced the shuttering of small shops in tiny towns like this one across America and across the globe. Many activists have focused on the importance of preserving land, but for us, like with cultural survival, it is equally important to provide a means for people to live in and carry on businesses which can be sustained in the physical environment. Bringing cultural survival to Tiverton is a way to be more expansive and inclusive. 
to bring a larger world into a smaller one. It's a way of showing the importance of the stories, traditions, and creative spirits that define cultures everywhere. We hope that 2021 will bring the Cultural Survival Bazaar back to Four Corners so that we can continue to provide this small community with this very special international event. Also important is that in this year of pandemic crisis, we continue to support each other and the work of cultural survival. Hi, everyone. Something's a little different. I have a bow tie on and I'm loving it. This is from our next vendor, A Thread of Hope Guatemalan Fair Trade, and they've been working with cultural survival for years and years. And much like the Zinzile Foundation, they work with hundreds and hundreds of artists and they've been established for 20 years. A Thread of Hope works with Mayan artists from Guatemala to bring their art to market to help them work in community, continue their traditions, and they have such a wide variety on their website. So when you visit the website, if you have kids in your life, be sure to check out all the options for kids. If you love shopping kitchenware, definitely check that out too. And then they have amazing, amazing options for woven items from scarves to ties and such. So definitely check it out and enjoy their presentation. Please keep in mind, we rely on you for donations and we're so grateful for each and every one of you who are calling, texting and donating online today via our website, bazaar.cs.org slash live. I apologize, bazaar.cs.org slash donate. Thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm Eliza Strode with the Thread of Hope Guatemalan Fair Trade. We've worked with indigenous Maya artisan cooperatives and families, over 450 artisans all together for 20 years now. We miss seeing you in person. Seeing some of you each year for all these years, you've come to feel like an extended family network to me. We love seeing old friends, making new friends and connections while offering the gorgeous work of these talented and lovely artisans. Guatemala has been under extended lockdown since mid-March with the airport, transportation between states and between many municipalities and all tourist areas, including beaches and lakefronts closed. Because most families are suffering economically, we have decided to donate half of our earnings over costs during this time to pay for food and water filters for artisans and families in the communities of Santiago Atitlan and Panabac who have been hard hit by COVID-19. Please contribute via the GoFundMe campaign link on our website. Here are some photos from our in-person events. Camino del hilo del vas que cicla en sí, energía que anima la vida en mí, en ti. Camino a seguir en ascenso espiral mental, personal, social, en lo espiritual, nahual, humano. Caminantes en la vía láctea, mapa iluminado de estrellas que se menean con la esfera, por dentro, por fuera, ritmo infinito que gira con pies en la tierra. Let's meet some of the artisans. First up, Asociación Maya, a women's cooperative of 180 backstrap loom weavers working together for almost 35 years. Members are widows of the 36-year genocide against indigenous people in Guatemala, and now their daughters too. They live in six rural communities in the highlands above Lake Atitlan. 
To make their beautiful weavings, first they wind skeins of lightweight bamboo, bamboo chenille, or cotton using a manual skein winder. The yarn is then hand dyed in small batches, four to six different colors per skein, using azo free dyes that are mixed to create each color. This space dyeing creates an ecot effect in which the colors flow beautifully throughout the weaving in a unique way. Skeins are then hung to dry. Then it is put on the swift and La Ordidora creates the warp, the weaving's vertical threads using a warping board, all while keeping count. The warp and the weft skein are knotted together and off they go to the weavers in their communities an hour away from the central workshop. The backstrap loom is the traditional form of weaving for women. Every part of the loom has a name related to childbirth. It takes about four hours to weave a scarf. The weavings are taken back to the workshop, washed with fabric softener and laid out to dry. They are inspected for quality and the fringes knotted. The co-ops tailor some of the best in Guatemala make beautiful ponchos, jackets, handbags, wallets, and more, and now masks made from lined lightweight bamboo weavings. These luscious handwoven pieces are then packed and shipped to customers all over the world. Trade shows in Guatemala help in finding new customers. At the co-ops annual meeting, all members gather to hear from the staff and board, elect board members, share a meal, and receive their patronage refund their share of the co-op's profits or savings, as they are called in co-ops. Most of the original members never had a chance to attend school and are illiterate, so they use their thumbprint to sign the annual meeting minutes. A nice tradition is that each weaver gives the co-op five quetzales, about 75 cents, a symbol of her gratitude for being part of the co-op. Weavers make three to six times more money per day via the co-op than they would weaving for the local market. Andres is a talented thread painter, embroidering birds and butterflies by hand using a sewing machine. These designs are characteristic of the traditional clothing in Santiago Atitlan. He makes coin purses, handbags, and more. His wife hand embroiders traditional women's blouses called wipiles. Now on to the artisans who make our amazing line of jewelry, handmade with high quality Czech glass beads. Creaciones Chonita is our principal jewelry partner in creating our collection of beautiful earrings, bracelets and necklaces, dream catchers, key rings, ornaments and backpack charms, handbags and coin purses, glasses holders and hair ornaments. They are also a producer for 10,000 villages. Another partner is Andrea and her sisters. Here's Andrea with the beginning of a beaded handbag made on a beading loom. Andres' wife and daughter make beautiful beaded hummingbirds and pigs with wings. Maria and Juan make beaded hummingbirds too, as well as octopuses, lizards, and frogs. Panabac is a community affected not only by the genocide, but also by a landslide during Hurricane Stan. The women of Panabac group make jewelry and also weave on small footlooms. They make wallets, coin purses, belts, camera straps, guitar straps, and clerical stalls. Upavim, meaning United to Live Better, is a co-op of 85 women in a poor neighborhood in Guatemala City. They make a variety of crafts, including worry dolls and worry doll wreaths, items for the kitchen, baby shoes, gifts for kids, ornaments, masks, and more and also market ceramics, clerical stoles, and wooden crafts made by other groups. With their craft sales and donations, they fund a school, preschool, after-school program, community library, clinic, lab, pharmacy, and soy plant, all of which make a tremendous difference in their community. Rafael makes our cocoa spirit, hand-carved coconut shell jewelry, using a painstaking process. We have 100 different designs. La Puerta Abierta, or Open Door Elementary School in Santiago Atitlan, provides an excellent trilingual education to local students as well as a mobile community library. The felt ornaments made by mothers in lieu of tuition have been a big hit. These are just some of the wonderful artisans with whom we work. Thread of Hope has something for everyone on your gift list. We're here in Guatemala working to add more products and information to our website every day. If there's anything you would like that isn't shown here on the website, please let us know.
In non-COVID times, we invite travel to Guatemala to meet the artisans, do volunteer work, and have a relaxing and enjoyable vacation with us. I am available to do Zoom presentations on a variety of topics about Guatemala. This is a trying and difficult time, and also a time to work on making the world a more connected and compassionate home for us all. We wish you well and appreciate your solidarity. Take care. This is a vendor that I've seen many times at the bazaars, and I hadn't ever had a chance to go to their website before, so I'm happy to see this and see all their products available online. Yeah. The website looks really interesting. It's good to know that all the proceeds go at this moment to um, buying, purchasing food for Mayan artisans. Oh, that pot holder. Um, I have one of those and I've been looking for a match, but it's been hard to um, find them. You, a lot of these products you can't really get outside of Guatemala. Yeah, they're one of a kind. Well, now you can purchase one here on their website. Mm -hmm. And this hand-painted stoneware owl. Oh. I love the colors. Yeah, that blue is very, um, is really beautiful. It's would match well with my kitchen. Yeah, they have a good selection of Tupperware. I like the natural material usage. Mm -hmm. Oh, look, they have little baby booties. Just I love those. <laughs> and the, the little elastic in the back is really great so that the kids don't kick them off it's always yeah. happening with booties it seems like good quality really good quality they yeah. thought through the the design of it yeah and it's really colorful too mm -hmm. the other items they have a diverse range some beautiful beaded ornaments here um mm. these birds are really wonderful the detail on on each of those individual birds is beautiful yeah stunning to see and it's all like handmade incredible. Mm -hmm. and the ornaments oh lovely that are diverse styles and you can see they have a lot of different kinds of products as well on the search um on the left corner there, you can see they have ornaments, they've got children's items. Mm -hmm. And scarves, ooh, just in time for autumn. This bamboo chenille material is super soft. I bought one of these when I went to Guatemala a few years ago and it's, it's really nice um, on your skin. Oh, it looks very soft. Oh, I like the color too. Mm -hmm. I believe they're naturally dyed. Wow, incredible in the blue. Ooh, that reminds me of the ocean. Next up, we have Domingo, who is a sculptor from the Shona people of Zimbabwe. He is both a sculptor and toy maker, and he's inviting you to allow your imagination to run wild. He is more than happy to take custom orders alongside all of the beautiful items you'll see in his presentation. Although he doesn't have a website, he's very excited to hear from you by phone or email. Today, I highly recommend sending an email with your phone number so that he can be sure to process your order on the bizarre day where he might have a higher demand than usual. In addition to making his own art, Domingo represents a cooperative that he started in Zimbabwe that creates beaded figurines from recycled supplies, including soda cans and fishing wire. So creative, the items are beautiful, they're useful, they're toys, they're items in your home that bring beauty and joy. And as he shares in his story, so much of his inspiration comes from a desire to play. So please do check him out. Also, please remember that what makes it possible for us to bring these artists to you is your donation. So please text us, call us, or donate via website. Hi, how are you? My name is Benan Domingo. I'm originally from Zimbabwe. I'm an artist. I make wire sculptures. The one that you are seeing in front of me. Yeah, I started um, uh, making wire sculptures when I was a boy, at the age of seven. Because uh, toys in my country used to be very expensive. So as kids, we used to make our own toys, like this car you're seeing here. 
So you make your car, you put uh, wheels and the long steering, you you start pushing it. So you have your choice. But we used to, to, to fetch these wires from coating as that our parents were using uh, is recycle. So uh, during, you know, during that time, I was very good in my friends used to depend on me, I used to make cards for them so that we can share the, 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 the pro, um, uh, those uh, wire ornaments. Um, then after I finished school, um, there was not uh, too much uh, in, uh, employment in my country. So we had to, I had to think of something that can generate money for me so that I, I, I keep myself busy. So I started making these uh, wire uh, products. Then I went to uh, a district where people who loves uh, crafts and uh, art and crafts, leaves. So I started selling my, my, my products over there. So in the beginning, in those, in those years, I used to only do the plain wire, which is, which is these ones, and uh, the bicycles. So I used to sell them to them. It wasn't not that many products that I was selling, but uh, they started giving me some ideas that try this and that. Uh, so I ended up making a wide range of things. Uh, you see these lovely giraffes, uh, and even this lovely uh, uh, motorcycle, the Holly Davidson. So that was uh, the beginning of my artwork. And... Um, uh, I sold my things uh, for some some years. Then I moved to South Africa to sell my things uh, over there, and uh, the business was okay too in South Africa. But after that, um, we said people maybe they are, are tired of only seeing plain wire. So we thought of something that is new. So we shifted from uh, the plain wire to uh, making uh, this artwork with a wire and wire and bit. The, the lovely artwork that you are seeing right now, rotating on the table, which are these lovely fish, lovely birds. So year 2000, that's when this artwork was born. Uh, all this artwork that you are seeing right now, uh, we started making them in the year 2000. So in that year, these, they started selling like uh, wood cakes, all the lovely stuff. Um, so we keep on trying new things uh, each and every time. And also people were uh, interested in certain things. So we're making whatever our customers wanted. So uh, uh, that's when I started um, doing uh, uh, international uh, shows. So I went to England to sell my artwork. I went to German Expo, Expo 2000 in Germany. Uh, people were loving all this uh, artwork. Uh, I had a shop in Zimbabwe. So in this shop, oh, some of the uh, people from the American embassy, they used to come and buy my artwork. So they see some of this. So there was an opportunity whereby uh, they wanted uh, some artists from Zimbabwe to come and showcase in America. So uh, they gave me an invitation to go to the uh, embassy where they had a meeting. So I ended up getting a visa to come to America and to sell my artwork. So people were so amazed to see my artwork and also I was happy with the outcome that uh, I, 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 I received here in America. Uh, but at that time, I used to come and go. So my best seller out of uh, these wine and beads is this uh, kitchens that I, I have here. So I've got um, the flat uh, kitchen, which goes for $5, and the 3D uh, that goes for $10. So to whoever wants to, um, to purchase this thing, they can uh, find me on my email, which is... Um, Ben Craft Z W at Yahoo.com. And also they can uh, find me on my phone number, which is 914 356 6912. 
and also I make uh, any anything I, I make uh, this lovely uh, um, uh, elephant head, which is so nice to collect. So many people collect this, and also I make them in, into different uh, type of um, uh, animals that a person is interested on. So, so, but these things I sell them at um, uh, an organization called Cultural Survival, which is, which are located in uh, Massachusetts, uh, in Boston, Cambridge. So they help us a lot. Uh, they they have uh, good shows that they they um, they showcase, and um, I think it's over ten years uh, me working with them. They are good people, and also when I'm there, I meet nice people that wants to learn uh, where I'm coming from, uh, how my culture is. Because this um, uh, cultural uh, survival um, organization is an indi indigenous uh, uh, showcase that uh, everyone from the whole world come and showcase their product. So. It's a good place to to be there and uh, showcase your things, and uh, I love I love to uh, meet new people. Not that they don't buy. Uh, the moment they appreciate what I'm what I'm doing, it it means a lot. So all these this uh, lovely giraffe that you are seeing right now, it's a toilet holder. It's an ornament. At the same time, you can use it. Uh, uh, for something, you can put it in your bathroom. It, it looks good. So this is this is uh, Domingo wire, wire and bead uh, art craft. Thank you so much for listening to my uh, story. Hi there, welcome to Domingo wire and beads work. We are just going to take a mini tour about Bernard Domingo's products. We got to hear from the vendor earlier, and now we are just going to see what else is available. Ooh, so here we have a car model. Also, hungbill birds. They're really colorful and come in all shapes and sizes. Ooh, this wonderful intricate hanging octopus along with other selections of animals, such as the owl, the penguin. The prices ranges from 20 to 45 and up, depending on the size of the item. As you can see here, there are many sizes. They make such a great gift to a friend, loved one or a gift for yourself, or a gift for yourself. They can become great collectibles, one of a kind. And they have a diverse range to choose from, such as these ones here. Oh, and a little seahorse. All the items are made from recycled materials, particularly wire coat hangers. All items are handmade and sculpted with beautiful beadwork, as you can see. Incredible time has been put into these. If so, if you are interested in purchasing any of these items or, or you wish to request an item to be specially made for you, you can contact Bernard Domingo via email at bencrafts at yahoo.com. That's B E N. C-R-A-F-T-Z-W at yahoo.com. You really just need to let your imagination flow. You can also call the vendor directly by phone at 914-356-6912. The most classic way of ordering me. Thank you. My name is Ahbe Jimenez, and I belong to the Maya Mam community in the Western Highlands of Guatemala. I'd like to welcome you to the first virtual bazaar that is being organized today. By supporting the bazaar, you are also supporting indigenous peoples, and particularly indigenous women's organizations around the world. You are also supporting their knowledge production because art isn't just art for itself, 
is a way for indigenous peoples to pass knowledge from one generation to another. And you're also supporting indigenous women's economic models. For indigenous peoples, art isn't just art for itself. It's very important for them for three main reasons. First, it's a way for them to produce and create knowledge, and that has been going on throughout the history. Second, it's a way for indigenous peoples to build and strengthen community cohesion by passing knowledge from one generation to another, from one relative to another, from one community to another. And third, it's very important for indigenous peoples to produce art because it's a way for them to fulfill and exercise their rights as indigenous peoples. So in this context of COVID-19, this virtual bazaar is key for indigenous peoples and your support is greatly appreciated because you're supporting indigenous peoples' organizations, you're supporting indigenous peoples' rights and identities. You're also empowering indigenous peoples and their respective organizations to advocate for and exercise their rights and practice self-determined development. So thank you very much. Chonte, Tontlach, and Chihuahua. Hi again. So I hope you had a chance to drop Domingo a line if you saw something in his presentation that inspired you or even that spurred your imagination to design something of your own with him, something like your favorite animal. The him and his family is preserving the Ayacucho tradition by making retablos that depict scenes of everything from fun-filled family festivities to important political statements. Their retablos look like a wooden box with sculptures painted on the inside, and these sculptures are made of potato and natural ink. The family takes you on a journey showing three generations in the workshop designing retablos, and the daughters will show you many options up close so you can see if there's a particular one that warms your heart. Please do have a look. They are available to contact on social media, both Facebook and Instagram, and also via email. They do not have their own website and they very much look forward to hearing from you with your orders. Have a look at their presentation. It'll be in Quechua and Spanish and there'll be captions for you to read. Thank you so much for your support and as usual, we thank you for your donations. We thank you for your support and making it possible for us to bring these indigenous artists to market so that they can sell their work directly to you. Soy Eleodora Jiménez Quispe, hija del gran maestro ayacuchano Florentino Jiménez Toma. Aquí en mi taller traba, trabajo junto con mi familia, mi esposo Fidel Palomino y mis dos hijas Amalia y Zuli y mi hijo Sebastián y que también mi mamá también me acompaña. Este arte he aprendido desde mi niñez, ¿no? Este arte como jugando como mi papá, mi mamá, todos trabajábamos en familia, entonces para mí ha sido este arte de aprender como jugando desde niña. Hola, buenas tardes. Nosotros somos Retablo Palomino Jiménez. Nosotros somos mujeres artesanas. Eh, yo soy Zuli, ella es mi hermana Danica. Eh, nosotros seguimos este arte tradicional muy hermoso de Perú. Eh, hacemos este trabajo magnífico, se llama Retablo. Es un, es un arte tradicional de Perú. 
porque es muy colorido. Aparte de eso, está hecho de harina de papa. Siempre la tradición de mi papá nos ha enseñado más con la papa. La papa se va a zancuchar. Una vez zancuchado y pelado, que aquí lo tengo, se voy a mezclar con el yeso. Con el yeso. Una vez ya mezclado este, esta masa de papa con el yeso, tiene que tener una elasticidad, ¿no? Como para poder trabajar y hacer las figuras. Como aquí mi hijo está haciendo ya una figura. Pero para hacer todo esto, se necesita solo son dos materiales principales, que es el cuchillo y un palito. Nosotros seguimos esta tradición de mis abuelos, mis padres, que ya se vio en el anterior video. Eh, nosotros vamos a presentar los productos que tenemos ahora. Tenemos retablos. Son retablos que representan muchos temas tradicionales de Perú, como festividades, eh, tiendas. Como artesanos, nosotros hacemos lo que el artesano mira al alrededor, el trabajo alrededor de nosotros. También tenemos eh, cuadros retablos, que son cuadros del material de cedro, con diseños. Aparte, con todo esto está hecho a mano. Si puede ver, la calidad es muy, es, de, es demasiado detalle, tiene demasiado detalle. Aparte, es mucho trabajo, toma mucho tiempo para hacer uno de ellos. Hacemos de diversos tamaños y depende al personalizado también lo hacemos, ¿no? depende de del, lo que el cliente quiere. También hacemos ornamentos eh, y trabajos con espejos, como marcos, para colocarlo en la pared y se verá muy hermoso en su casa. ¿no? También hacemos retablos um, pequeños. Hacemos muchos, muchos trabajos hermosos. Este es otro, es un retablo también pequeño. Eh, Utilizamos colores muy fuertes como el azul, rojo, amarillo, que son colores también primarios. Eh, tienen mucho significado en Perú. Tiene un acabado. Todo, todo acá está hecho a mano. Nosotros lo pintamos. Utilizamos también colores que, que hacemos en casa con huevo y yema para que se haga un poco brilloso. Um, pues recurrimos a técnicas tradicionales. Bueno, presentando, este es un cuadro, se trata el tema de sala de perros. Este es un cuadro que representa la venta de máscaras. Perú eh, es muy reconocido por las diabladas en Puno y también en, en el mes de febrero hay muchos festivales las personas les gusta hacer danzas, bailar, eh, se colocan máscaras, también otras personas eh, hacen sus propias máscaras y comienzan a danzar en el mes de febrero en la región en la que escucha. Los cuadros pequeños eh, tenemos de varios temas, venta de sombreros, de sombreros muy coloridos, Sombreros eh, guamanguino, sombrero de guamanga que se usa las mujeres, lo usan para lanzar. En la... También tenemos festivales, un cuadro pequeño de festival. cuadro de textiles todo está hecho a mano es una dedicación completa para hacer este tipo de trabajo toma mucho tiempo en verduras y, y también son frutas y también tenemos en verduras y pica de pelo. ahora vamos a presentar eh, los retablos eh, bueno, 
eh, tenemos diferentes tamaños de retablos, retablos grandes, como podemos ver aquí atrás, retablos grandes, eh, tarados y echados, tenemos retablos de medianos y pequeños. Eh, vamos a comenzar con los pequeños. Los pequeños que tenemos aquí son retablos, como puede ver, eh, todo también hecho a mano, pieza a pieza, eh, pintado a mano, eh, los colores todos naturales y con un diseño de flores, como es de nuestro estilo familiar, con flores. Y, y bueno, podemos ver, aquí es, una, es, una, es un mercado textil. De curandería del Amazonas, como pueden visualizar, eh, están ahí los chamanes ahí trabajando, siendo, usando pieles de, pieles de animales, uh, hierbas medicinales para curar las enfermedades en la Amazonía. Vamos son los textiles, un lindo trabajo, eh, se puede ver el trabajo todo con los colores las personas trabajando, haciendo los, eh, haciendo los teñidos, hilando, para hacer nuevos mantos, poner en pesebre, para época de navidad, eh, la Virgen María, y el niño Jesús, el San José y los animalitos, y los ángeles. como pueden ver, muy lindo, un trabajo muy rústico y tradicional de familia, de generación en generación. Ah, podemos nosotros, eh, aquí como pueden ver, en, en, en las portadas, las flores, es muy característico de nuestro estilo de familia, el diseño de flores alrededor del trabajo. Ah, aquí es una venta de chullos, que es, es, es un es, de la indumentaria en Perú, en las, en, en las, en las montañas, ¿no? Y es un, un taller, es un, es un, no sé si puede decir aquí, el taller, están haciendo los chullos, los danzantes, siempre los músicos danzantes bailando, una variedad de colores que, de chullos, que se, de chullos, gorras, que hay eh, diferentes colores, ¿no? con instrumentos musicales para la casa, para decorar el árbol o el, la pared, lindos pequeños y los instrumentos. También hay uh, aquí ángeles ángel pequeños también, lindos instrumentos musicales. Y hacemos también esqueletos también, mujer y hombre, o, ajá, con sus instrumentos y con sus instrumentos de cementa típica. Como pueden ver, es bonito está hecho en Perú, muy colorido y que es, se puede colocar acá, se puede colocar. Estamos muy agradecidos de Cultura Survival por ayudarnos y a promover nuestro arte tradicional. Cualquier consulta, eh, no sea tímido y es, nos puede dejar un mensaje en los correos que vamos a mandar. Eh, muchísimas gracias y que tenga un grandioso día. Muchas bendiciones a su familia. I was researching in Instagram and I found this account 
altarpieces Palomino Jimenez. And I found out all these beautiful pieces. Some of them seem so unfamiliar for me, but so bright colors and beautiful. It seems that they are coming from Peru. Yes, they are representing part of the life on the Agacuchana culture. How beautiful. I think I have never seen masks like those. They are so particular. It says that this has been made by the family of Palomino Jimenez and that they are experts in this tradition of creating all these beautiful pieces of art. And they are as well indigenous artisans. Oh my gosh, they are so beautiful. Definitely, I want to have one of those in my house. Afro Root Collective is the next vendor that I have the opportunity to introduce. And Rita is the owner of Afro Root Collective, which works with women in Uganda to create handicrafts that are functional in our everyday life. A wide array of designs are made from tree bark. Also other natural fibers, including jute, banana bark, and raffia. She'll tell you all about it, but it's quite remarkable. And when you think about these fibers, you can think about it just like cotton. All of our clothing that's made from cotton is made from a plant and the tree bark is just like that. Just another sustainable possible fiber. Since I have yet to purchase one of Rita's purses, I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you about our profile artists whose faces you will not see in the videos today, whose stories you will not yet hear, but who you can visit on our website. This purse, beautiful and woven, much like the purses you'll see in Rita's presentation, is from one of our profile artists who you can find at bazaar.cs.org slash live in our list of profile artists. So as you go through, be sure to shop not only for all the artists that you have seen in today's show, but also please be curious, explore each artist and their offerings and each vendor and their offerings. Please remember, that without you, we cannot bring Indigenous art to market. We invite you to text, to call cultural survival, or to donate online. Thank you so much and enjoy Rita's presentation. Hi, uh, my name is Rita Nakandi. I'm the founder of Afri Roots Collective. Afri Roots Collective is a socially responsible enterprise that sells uh, sustainable handicrafts made by Ugandan women. And we use part of the proceeds to train more women to become self-sufficient. Some of the products are made from uh, fig tree bark, which is bark cloth and designed with raffia or uh, banana tree bark, and some products are made uh, using uh, the African print. Um, bark cloth making dates back uh, 16 years, 600 years ago, uh, when our great grandparents and ancestors used it for clothing, bedding, um, funerals, and sometimes they used it for curtains. And uh, when cotton was introduced, uh, the process, the tree bark uh, making uh, kind of, uh, the, died out a little bit and most people focused on the cotton because it's softer than the tree bark. And uh, in 2005, UNESCO declared the bark to be a tangible product of Uganda that raised the profile of bark. Uh, some artists and uh, designers started making different things out of bark. The UN trained uh, two ladies how they could design different things from bark to uh, eradicate the poverty. And um, I'm going to show you some of the products that we make from bark. And first of all, let me explain to you how we make, how we get the bark from the tree. The trees are not damaged, so no, no trees are uh, uh, killed. So it's a sustainable process. If you want to see uh, further pictures, please check on the website to see the process. So we scrape up the rough surface from the tree. 
Then after we wrap the tree with banana leaves to protect it from direct sunlight and also uh, to protect it from birds, just to prepare, prep it for the next harvest. And then we use a wooden mallet to actually pound the bark. It spreads out, it's non woven. Then we put it in the sun to dry. The more exposure to sunlight, the darker it gets. So uh, some designs that we may use are uh, raffia. Uh, as you see, some people have used it for wrapping gifts. Uh, raffia is grass and it's really uh, strong. So you can, it's so hard to actually break it. So I'm going to show you some of the products to make from bark. Uh, we have some um, eyeglass cases that come in different star designs. As you see, this is a uh, screen printed on, and then this is twisted raffia. So the women twist the raffia with their hands and then after we sew it onto the back with the machine and then with this we use screen printing and then the women hand stitch the wrap into the back. So that's one of the, uh, some of the designs. So I'll start with the pouches. We have these small bags. This is pouch seed small. Uh, this is one uh, design that we have, but we have it in different designs. We also have it in embroidery, but it also has uh, a wrist. So uh, it's easier to walk around with. And we have the second size, which is uh, pouch B. As you see, this is all hand stitched on with raffia. You can see the details. So it has the back and the front. And then uh, the other size, the larger one is um, pouch A. So we call this design the big five, as you see all these uh, big animals and the details that's uh, raffia, that's stitched on. And then um, we also have some pencil cases. So these also come in different styles. So this is not, the knots are raffia. So it's on in raffia and the ladies make the knots out of it. And the other uh, products are the crossbacks. The crossbacks comes in the, they come in different uh, sizes and styles. So we have the first one, which we call the passport bag. It comes in different designs. It has two pockets, one here. It's so easy to carry around if you just want to take a walk. It's, it, we also have a uh, larger size, which is actually embroidery. So as you see, so with then we have uh, the other uh, this, uh, style that we call uh, the jersey bag. The jersey bag doesn't have a zipper in the front. So you can, some people love the fact that when they put in the phone, it's easier to take it out when they are taking walks. And uh, we also have it in the larger size that fits like a tablet and they're all cushioned. So they all have come in different design. I just brought a few samples for you to see and get an idea of what we have on our website. And then uh, we also have this, this, uh, this uh, style of cross pads. So this is wider and then this is longer as you see, but it's almost the same size. They all fit uh, tablets and um, Kindles. Then we have the other cross pads with the wider base. We have this that's shorter. Uh, most people love this style. We had this last year for the first time and we sold a lot of these and we have it in the longer size as you see this. Um, this is also a uh, raffia, As, so the knots are raffia, the women uh, sew on the raffia and make knots out of this. It has a wider base and uh, you can see the details, um, it's really cool. Then we also have the clutches, uh, this time we brought a, a different color, we have it in black, all the white stuff, that's raffia, all the notes, that's raffia, sewn in raffia. And then we, we had customers that asked for the scraps, which were able to from, uh, add on. So we listened, we have this in store. If you want some, please, uh, you can visit our website. Uh, then I'll show you some of the wall hangings we have. They also come in different, um, they're made differently. We have those that are painted on back, like this, these are small in size. So it's all painted on bark. And then we have uh, these artist and uh, wall hangings too. That's, so this artist, you can see it's all done on tree bark. All that is tree bark, the more exposure to sunlight, the darker it gets, even the lighter one is tree bark. So I work with this artist because he works with women that actually put on all these things onto his art pieces. He directs them what to do and being able to get everything done. You can see this is a family, mother, father, and their three children. You can uh, uh, interpret it the way you want, but it's really a uh, nice work that uh, he does. And then the other wall hangings we have are made from a banana tree bark. With the banana tree bark, we dry the banana bark and then cut it out in different shades. You can see this is the African homestead. 
So these also come in different sizes, as you see the details. So, and then we have some that are animals, if you're interested. Some have uh, elephants, see? So these come in uh, four sizes as well. And the other wall hangings we have are made from uh, fig tree bark, similar to the one I showed you initially, um, like this one. And then this is embroidery. Uh, we also have these in different sizes. So um, we have them in the small size like these. Yeah, and um, that's all with the wall hangings. I'll show you some of the kitchen wares that we have. We have uh, the open meats that are cushioned and easy to use, uh, very colorful. The patchwork is beautiful. And uh, we also have pot holders you can easily put in your hand. As you see, uh, it's, it's also cushioned. And we have the trivets. So we have trivets made from uh, banana tree bark and raffia. It's all handmade. And we also have a trivet made with, from uh, recycled banana, I mean recycled bottle caps. So the recycled bottle caps, the women actually um, wrap the, uh, the uh, bottle cup with the African material and then they sew it in the back Then after they piece it together while sewing with threads. So it holds up pretty well. Some people you just frame it and put it uh, on their walls, but so it's, we mainly make it for the um, as a tree bed. And we also have a front uh, for those that are interested. Very beautiful patchwork. It goes over your shoulder. It fits everyone and it has a pocket as you see. So pretty. I don't even want to take it off. <laughs> then I'll show you some other. So we have some sticks that come in um, giraffe. Giraffe, zebra, and elephants, if you're interested. And we also have salad spoons that are made from uh, ebony wood. This is all natural wood. It's not dyed. It's, it comes in black. Then uh, we also have a set of six place mats and one runner. These place mats are made from uh, raffia and viscous threads. So I love this group because uh, she works with ladies that are single mothers and taking care of their kids. She allows the mothers to come to the workshop with our kids. So as you see, it's a set of six placements and one runner. It comes in different colors and uh, different patterns. So you can see this pattern. It comes in uh, green, uh, orange, yellow, also the natural raffia. You can also see this. This is a different pattern as well. And the other thing that we have, we have the uh, shopping bags. We call these fold-up bags. It uh, folds up pretty well. Then you open it up when you go to the store. You can easily put it in the bag or just carry, carry it along uh, with you like this. It has a strap. So it all comes in different color as well. And it's easy to put uh, together, put, put back together the way it is after shopping. And uh, the other thing we have is, we call this the bread basket, stroke um, napkin holder, or some people use it for kids. It's easy to store. It falls flat. It has all these knots. You just open, open it up. And if you want to keep it away after using, well and good. So it also comes in different, with different designs, but the same usage. And we have uh, laptop sleeves. We have laptop sleeves made from banana tree bark. They come in different sizes. This has Hakuna Matata, which means no worries. Those who have seen the Lion King. We also have uh, other designs too. And we also have these laptop sleeves that are made by a group in the northern part of Uganda. And this group helps all these women that were abduct formerly abducted by the rebel group. So it kind of restores their lives. This has who did it, uh, a little bit about of their story and how this helps uh, this person that makes this. See how, and they're really cushioned very well, if you see inside. Okay. And then, um, now we also have the paper bracelets. Some of you have seen them. Uh, we call this uh, paper mache the method. So they cut out the papers and then fold each bead. And then after they add every bead on this uh, long string. So they come in different colors and um, sizes as well. And we have uh, the hats. It's summertime, those who are interested. Uh, this is a patched hat that uh, it would look good on you. We also have the cups too, as you see. 
And then uh, the other product that we have is the backpack. We had the backpacks last year, it was our first time, and we did well with that. So this is for ladies. It's pretty uh, cool. It has a pocket in the back, a pocket inside, and a zipper. It comes with different designs too. And we also have a, a unisex handbag, backpack, sorry. Um, this one, it comes in different designs too. It's, it's cushioned, you can put in your laptop, easy to travel with. Um, last but not least, I'm going to show you the handbags that we have. Some of you have bought them. I just brought uh, different styles for you to see. And we have them in different designs. So we have this style. Uh, this is smaller, this is larger. You can see it's actually big, but pretty cool. So this is all um, tree bark and um, knotted uh, raffia. So see, if you check the website, you'll be able to see the other uh, dis uh, designs that we have. The other design that we have is this. We've had this since we started. So this is the bigger size, this is smaller. It comes in different colors and designs. We started bringing back the black again. And uh, people love this because the zipper goes all the way. And it's cushioned inside, it has the skirt. So this you can easily use with your, for your laptop, okay? And then we also have another style that, um, that really, see this? So we have all these in different styles, and uh, this is the different, this, the styles are the same, but the sizes are different, but we have the different designs. Then we have the newest that we made this year that we think uh, some of you would love. Uh, we made this because uh, most people love the design and decided, we decided to make a handbag out of it. Um, thank you so much for watching our video. If you have any questions, please uh, email us or give us a call and we'll respond to you as soon as possible. Uh, otherwise, stay safe and thank you for your support. Have a nice one. Wow, have you guys heard about Afro Collective? It seems like a great enterprise. Yes, um, it's a group of um, Uganda women who work on socioeconomic um, financial situations and it supports their lives. My favorite thing about their items are the bags and the level of detail. And it's incredible that these um, are made out of bark material, fig, banana. So beautiful. Yeah, you could never have guessed that. Like, look at the detail on that bag. And I was thinking about a gift for friends who recently bought a home. Mm. Yeah, these items look, the design of these baskets might be a good item to gift. I love these little colorful baskets. It would be amazing to have them all over your kitchen, to brighten things up, store little things in them. So that's one option, a woven bowl. That's really beautiful. Yeah, the design. Mm -hmm. The blue and the white is really pretty together. Oh, but the trivet, that's so sweet. Helps protect the table. You can put something hot on it. Mm -hmm. Yes. I feel like we always just have like little practical things as trivets, but it would be beautiful to have one of these to decorate your table with. Yes, and look at this long um, set of placement tables. Mm -hmm. Wow, there's so many options. Yeah, I like how colorful they are. That light purple Ooh. one in particular. Ooh, this color is very natural, the table runner. In the Afro Root Collective introduction, I mentioned cotton as a sustainable fiber, but not all cotton is created equal. For the next vendor presentation, we have the Radical Grandma Collective that is a group of women representing the Nanang Bong community in Thailand. And it's 20 weaver activists who grow their own cotton and weave it into beautiful scarves, all in support of their environmental restorative justice. They work with six women here in the US to collaborate to bring the scarves to market. And they're a wonderful example of what's possible when you give 
grandmothers the microphone or the megaphone to speak up for the environment. Please enjoy shopping and please remember, without you, we're not able to bring these wonderful projects to market, supporting indigenous rights, supporting indigenous tradition, and we welcome your calls, your texts, your online donations. Thank you so much. Enjoy the Radical Collective presentation. มันไม่สิ่งมีสิ่งอะไรที่จะทําทําให้เรากลัวเลยแล้วเข้าไปได้ใหญ่ก็ไปแต่ถ้าเข้าผ่าไปไปกําคันเดียวหันแล้วบ
At the moment, the best way to support the Radical Grandma Collective is to visit our website, RadicalGrandmaCollective.com, to learn more about their work. You can watch videos about how the mine got started and why mining has had such a negative impact on this community. If you're really feeling generous, you can also purchase one of the Grandma Scarves right from our website. Next, we have a song from Deborah Spears Moorhead, who's indigenous to New England, representing Seekonk, Poconoit, and Wampanoag people here in New England. And we're grateful for Deborah's song tribute in particular because she's drawing attention to the missing and murdered indigenous women here in the US. Now, COVID has been negatively impacting indigenous people worldwide dis disproportionately throughout the pandemic. And during the pandemic, there has been much needed conversations related to race and racism here in the US and globally. Now, the conversation about race continues to evolve along with the language. And while people of color used to be referred to as POC, they're now referred to as BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C, as a creative way to specifically emphasize the negative and harmful ways that Black people have been treated through the lens of anti-Blackness and Indigenous people have been treated through the lens of invisibility, either being made to be seen as part of the past or such a small percentage of the populations where there was genocide that they're not considered within the larger conversations. And of course, as you know, cultural survival works to advocate to counter this invisibility because we know that indigenous people globally make up over 6% of the population. And that through this song, we stand in solidarity, not only with indigenous people worldwide, but also with the black global community and we encourage your activism on this topic of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Back to the concept that Daisy shared with us at the beginning of the show. She mentioned how the art that is made for us by each and every Indigenous artist is not only beautiful, it's also prayerful and medicine. So let's take in the song and thank you. Hi, my name is Deborah Spears Moorhead of Nedeker Singers. I'm a Seekonk Poconoke at Wampanoag. Uh, the song that I'm about to sing is to bring awareness of all the missing and murdered Native American women. One is too many. We are, we are. We are, hey yo, red is the color that spirit can see. Can you tell me, great spirit, can you find me? We are, we are. We are yo Yahweh, Yahweh, we are yo we are yo we are yo Red is the color that spirit can see. Won't you tell me, great spirit, can you find me? We are, we are, we are, hey, yo. Yahweh, Yahweh. We are here, we are yo we are yo Red 
What is the color that spirit can see? Won't you tell me, great spirit, can you find me? Way away, way away, oh. Yahweh, 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 oh, Yahweh, hey, oh, Yahweh, hey, oh. Red is the color that Spirit can see, won't you tell me, great spirit, can you find me? Way away, way away, oh, Yahweh, Yahweh, way away, oh. We are hey yo. We are hey yo. Red is the color that spirit can see. Won't you tell me, great spirit can? You find me way away, way away, oh, Yahweh, 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 oh, way away, way away, oh, Yahweh. We are here. We are As we get closer and closer to the end of the show, I want to take a moment to thank you all for joining us. We have two more vendors left to highlight, and I do hope you have been shopping during the show and or making note of all of your favorite items so that you're sure to visit bazaar.cs.org slash live for all the artist profiles. Next up, we have Vital, and this is a collaboration between Albert and Timoteo, focusing on the folk art that represents mountain shepherds from the Andes to the Pyrenees. It's an exploration of the relationship between the environment and livestock. And some of you may not have noticed that there is a part of my set that is not as visible. So behind my back, I have Vital's shepherd pillow. And I use this at home as part of my work setup to support good posture, and comfort in my back. As you can imagine, it's wonderful on any couch and any bed. This is their primary design and they have two different print options. I hope you do visit their website and I'll leave the rest to Albert to share the story of the business, to Timoteo to share the story of his master weaving. And I want to remind you, without you, we cannot bring these items to market for indigenous artists. Please do donate, please do text, call, or visit our website, bazaar.cs.org slash donate. And thank you again for being with us today. Vola viva, una tradició que fàcilment, amb el pas del temps i la modernitat pot desaparèixer. Cerquem com combinar la tradició de la qual som hereus amb un disseny innovador, tot amb materials nobles. A través de l'art, introduïm una nova forma de col·laboració entre diferents cultures i cerquem de crear un espai sense fronteres on s'explori allò que ens vincula. Voldríem transmetre uns valors comuns d'una estètica que ens identifiqui i que alhora deixi palesa la identitat de cada comunitat. Des del Mediterrani fins al Cantàbric s'estén la llarguíssima espinada del Pirineu. 
Aquest conjunt geogràfic tingué des de fa segles la seva pròpia identitat cultural, agrícola i espiritual. Andorra, malgrat el seu petit territori, forma part d'aquesta extensa geografia i del seu ric patrimoni. Amb la voluntat de no perdre la identitat en aquest petit país i la nostra connexió amb la natura, neix el projecte. La nostra primera actuació de vital a Andorra ha sigut salvar els vellons de les ovelles que cada primavera xolla abans que fossin destruïdes. I hem creat, amb la col·laboració de la dissenyadora i cosidora de Massa Osorio, el coixí de pastor, l'Oriana d'Ovelles Andorranes i, sobretot, la manta del pastor. Una manta creada per anar a la muntat, per seguir la nostra tradició. Per seguir la tradició que ha sigut l'escultura de la natura. En aquesta cabana, els pastors passaven les seves nits d'estiu i guardaven els seus ramats al voltant. Aquesta cabana ha fet amb pedra seca. Nosaltres volem recuperar on els nostres avantpassats i recuperar la nostra connexió amb el territori, amb la natura, amb el bestiar i amb els altres mateixos, com a comunitat. Mi nom és Timoteo Carito Sacaca, nascido en en el anexo de Santa Bárbara del sitio de San Pablo de la provincia de Canchis, Cusco. Yo he sido hijo de una tejedora, no he podido estudiar porque ha fallecido mi madre, de mi padre soy hijo negado y por lo tanto mi mamá me ha enseñado una parte de tejidos desde mis 10 años de edad. Por lo tanto, a los 15 años de edad ya sabía algo de tejer, ubiqué al sitio de Pitomarca, a los, y sus comunidades campesinas como Chilca, Nanizo, Chuyuclo, así esas comunidades he aprendido un poco más de tejer. Las técnicas como se llama el ligue, patapallay, palma y ramos y luego el tapiz. Antes yo era proveedor de tejidos para las tiendas del Cusco. A todas las tiendas del Cusco llevé los tejidos recolectando de las comunidades campesinas de Altoandinos. Después encontré buenos tejidos antiguos, 100, 200 años de edad, los cuales eran muy finas, los tejidos con, teñidos con tinte natural. Por lo tanto, era muy preocupante que estaba perdido el tinte natural como antes que practicaba. con 100% natural. Ya logrando esto, los tentes hemos formado pequeños asociaciones. Quiero enviar últimamente este mensaje a todo el mundo esta sabiduría, esta riqueza de acá del Perú de, de Pitumarca a diferentes países como a Nueva York, como a París, como a España y a otros países y así necesito también apoyo de diferentes personalidades o países que me pueden apoyar para poder difundir especialmente esta sabiduría del Inca en sus países como, como que puedan necesitar o pedir ellos. Eso es mi mensaje. Muchísimas gracias. Hi everyone. Next up we have Silver Sahara Handmade. And before I tell you about them, I want to remind you that in addition to all of the vendors that we have spotlit today through their video presentations, there are seven additional vendors of indigenous art, including the artists themselves, who are highlighted on our bazaar.cs.org slash live website. I'm wearing one of their bracelets now, so be sure to check them out in addition to the vendors you've seen in the videos. 
So it is my honor to introduce Silver Sahara Handmade. They are the final vendor we will be spotlighting today. And they represent a collaboration between two people, Mohammed of Fagora, Morocco, and Carolina of Martha's Vineyard here in the US. Together, they bring work from the communities, Berber, Torg, and Emezig, representing all of the traditions and crafts available in those communities, which is why there's such a wide range of possibilities for shopping on their website. I cannot emphasize enough the wide variety. I'm talking punched lanterns, coffee grinders, um, rugs, and jewelry, of course. There's also embroidery, which you'll see in the presentation. So thank you again. I want to remind you that without you, we can't put all of this together and bring indigenous art to market. We hope you take the time to visit the Silver Sahara Handmade website, shop, enjoy, and also we invite you to donate to see us via text, phone, or via our website. Thank you so much and enjoy the Silver Sahara presentation. Is uh, and welcome from uh, Silver Sahara. You paint it for the manganese. Mm -hmm. This is the manganese mixed uh, copper. Yes. This is special green colors. Yes. This is the green colors. Please use it for the roof tailors. Sun, I like these colors. After you use two articles inside indicating here. You finish, you close it, and then you see the fire in the ground. Yes. The fire, please, is it wood, palm, and the wood from the desert. For one kiln, is it five hours? Uh -huh. 1,200 degrees. Mm -hmm. I like these colors, please, you change it from colors green. Mm -hmm. It's okay? Yes. It's and here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven kiln, seven family. Thank <laughs> you. 
Austin was the hell. So it looks like Silver Sahara has a many options. Yes, look at the rings. My goodness. There's such ranges. Wow, yeah, and that they're all handmade is amazing. Ooh, look at that, that pendant. Oh, and the earrings. Oh, they also have bracelets too. Wow, they're so nice. And pillows, everything's so decorative. A diverse range. I can't believe there's a coffee grinder. <laughs> In a coil basket. Wow, that's beautiful. Those rugs are really neat as well. Oh, and that silver pendant. I think that the Hamza hand is an ancient protective symbol, that hand. Mm -hmm. mm, very magical. I loved the embroidery image in the video. This is amazing. Look at these dresses. Mm -hmm. Think about how much time has gone into each of those embroideries. Yes, and these leather slippers. I've always wanted some slippers. This seems like a really good item to purchase. Mm -hmm. And remember how they made these bowls? It was really cool to watch the man make it out of clay. That particular green is really lovely. Incredible work that every item is made out of hand. And it's part of their culture as well. The pottery that's being passed down from like one generation to another, incredible. So we're at the end of our time together and you can tell that's true because my laptop is out and my glasses are on, but at this point we're family. So because it's our closing and because thank yous are such an important part of our entire process, I wanna be sure to thank all of the key parts of what made this possible. So we have come to the end of our first ever virtual bazaar. Thank you for joining us and feel free to stay on with us via Zoom, Facebook, or YouTube Live for the next half hour or so. If you'd like to send in questions for our CS staff commentators to respond to, we're more than happy to interact while you're online. Many of the participating vendors are online today with us as well. We would like to say a few words of thanks. First, to the artists and vendors who were so brave and collaborative in this process of going online. Thank you for trusting us, and we hope the reward for your communities comes back tenfold in sales for the beautiful art you sell. Second, to the shoppers. Yes, that's you. Thank you. Your participation makes everything we dream up possible and worthwhile. Your appreciation of art and specifically indigenous art is noted. Third, to the guest speakers. Thank you so much. Daisy, Roz, Peter, and Ashby. Without you, we couldn't have told the same heartfelt story of indigenous art, leadership, and what it means to be an indigenous rights supporter. Finally, a big thank you to the staff at the Abbey Museum in Maine for all of their support, encouragement, and quite frankly, words of wisdom for how to pull all of this off. We appreciate your spirit of collaboration and the great work you do with your market. So as we sign off, I wanna ask you, did you know that the sale of art and crafts are the second largest source of income globally for indigenous communities? Well, we hope you continue shopping all day today, bazaar.cs.org slash live. And that same site will be up until August 25th. 
so that as more and more gift ideas come to mind, you can come back to visit and purchase more items. As you saw, there's such a wide variety. I want to thank you for spending the afternoon with me and with us. Take good care. My name is Amalia Fourhawks. I represent a family of 16 silversmiths from New Mexico. We are an intertribal family with Navajo, Zuni, Apache, Mohawk, and Cheyenne members. When we started with cultural survival, there were three of us that were doing silversmithing and selling our work. Because of the bazaars, we now have 16 members of our family who are able to support themselves and express their artistic abilities through silversmith and their traditional crafts. So we thank you for that. You've made a difference. Cultural survival bazaars are annual celebrations of indigenous arts, music, and cultures from around the world. Presented in New England since 1982, these events feature indigenous artists, community cooperatives, and performers selling their handmade artwork, demonstrating their traditional craft skills, and sharing their music. My name is Silao Valadez from central west of Mexico in Nayarit. I'm part of the Wirarica tribe. I'm a yarn painting artist, which is a traditional technique from that region. I also support and represent 150 families from the same tribe that I come from, who specialize in beaded sculptures, beaded jewelry, and the yarn paintings. And I want to thank you for making these events available for us and exposing the art of these very talented people. Yo me llamo Maria Schoch y mi comunidad se llama Caserí el Triunfo Gil 2 de Sololá. El pasar nos ayuda a nosotras para comprar comida, para comprar ropa y para mandar sus hijos a la escuela, las mujeres. The exceptional handmade crafts showcased at the Cultural Survival Bazaars have brought crowds of loyal supporters from the New England area for many years. Serving as a vehicle for educating the public about indigenous rights, fair trade, and environmental concerns, the bazaars attract people for globally minded shopping and the opportunity to learn more about indigenous cultures. Proceeds support the artistic traditions of indigenous communities and provide capital and sustainable income to individual artisans and their families. <laughs>